Serb here from Circuits and Sounds. I welcome you to the sixth part of episode one, Signal Multiplication and the Tenu version. This video will be my last part in episode one before we start moving forward with the other modules that I'm wanting to put inside the box. Today we're going to focus on what is called the utility modules, the buffered multiple and the quad attenuverter. Like the LFO and the envelope generator, we've been using these modules in my previous videos for patching, but now it's time to take a dedicated look at what's going on behind the panel. First we'll take a look at the buffered multiple. So what exactly is a buffered multiple? It's kind of like a cloning machine. If we put a signal into the input, then we magically get three copies of the input signal at the output. Hey, how you doing? Oi, oi. In the synth world, a multiple is just a fancy way of saying a copy of some signal, whether that's audio or control voltage. There are a few ways to make a multiple. The simplest is being a stack cable. I don't have any, so I'll put a picture up. But you can basically plug one cable into another one, and then another cable, and then another one, however many copies you need. Then that cable into a signal. Then you have multiple copies of that same signal. Another way is to break the stacking out into multiple jacks and create a passive multiple. Again, don't have a picture, so here's one on the screen. But you take one input and there's as many outputs as you need. Both of these methods are great, but they're not getting any sort of power. So the problem is the more and more multiples that the signal you create, the less power the original signal has to deliver. Which isn't good if one of those signals is controlling pitch on an oscillator, because then it starts to sound out of tune. So this is where the buffer multiple comes into play. It basically uses op amps to buffer each copy of the input signal, so then they can maintain their signal power. The idea is that the input has a very high impedance, therefore reducing any unwanted interaction with any previous circuit stages, and a very low output impedance, so that the multiple copies can deliver their full power to wherever they need to go. That's the basic premise of a buffered multiple. It's not the most exciting module in the world, but it sure is handy. Sure is. I'll say. Really expands your sound making options. Alright, this is wigging me out. Can you guys get out of here please? Come back later and I might have another job for you. Well this sucks. Oh, come on, really? Never wanted to help anyway. I don't pay you all for nothing. You don't pay us at all. Jeez, some people. Anyway, let's take a close up down here. So this module is based off Sam's 1161 buff and multiple, which you can find just up here. But I've actually done the opposite to most of my other modules, and I've reduced the amount of features that this module has, just to keep it nice and tidy. Well, I took one output off and saved myself an op amp or two, so it's not exactly the end of the world. But as you can see, we have two copies of the same circuit, each with one input and three outputs, four if you include the LED. So the multiple kind of works like the opposite to a mixer. Instead of taking many ins to one out, we take one in to many outs. So let's plug in the LFO and the envelope generator, just for the sake of demonstration purposes. We can then take these copies to wherever we need in the synth for modulation, with no drop in power delivery. We don't need to go through any patches with it. You've already seen in my previous video so we can put both audio and CV into the malt and then get three copies of the input, with the fourth being used to light up the LED. So let's just jump straight into how the circuit works behind the panel. So as we can see, it's a fairly straightforward circuit with only a single quad op amp tube required. Also note that we have two different grounds, as I've converted this to my single rail standard. We have our actual ground, or battery negative, and then our virtual ground for the input and output jacks. We can see on the left hand side here that we have our input jack, which is connected to all four of the op amps wired as non-inverting buffers, with a 10 amp pull down resistor connected to actual ground, which creates our very high impedance on the input side. Each op amp creates a buffered copy of the input signal, with three of them being used for the output jacks and the last one for the LED indicator. We can also see that on the output of each op amp, we have a 100 ohm resistor, creating the very low output impedance so that each copy can deliver its full power, and then a 1K for the LED so we don't burn it out. This entire circuit is then copied a second time 
so that we can have two different signals to create copies of. Well, that's all there is to it. Let's move on to called attenuator. So the word attenuator is a combination of the words attenuator and inverter, which means that this module can take an input signal and we can either adjust its level in the positive direction or invert it and adjust its level in the negative direction. Normally an attenuator is just a single knob for a parameter on a module. But since I didn't have any in my synth and I wanted to play around with signal inversion, I just made a dedicated module and made the most of the available space. So now we have the quad attenuverter. So to demonstrate how attenuversion works, I think I might call in some help again. Oi oh guys, come back. I promise I'll pay you this time. What is it this time? I was literally just about to have lunch. Ugh, how much more work. You're gonna help me demonstrate how attenuversion works. Attenu what? Just shut up and listen for a sec, all right? So imagine that each of these guys is a different kind of signal going into the attenuverter. Hey, I'm looking good. What the hell is this? I haven't changed at all. Yeah, I've got a special job for you. Just give me a minute. So the idea is that we can take these signals and put them into the attenuverter and then adjust their level in either the positive or the negative direction. Like so. Then when the knob is in its middle position, the signal has no level in either direction and almost ceases to exist. What a roller coaster. I need a minute after that. You could say that again. So next, I wanted to demonstrate a concept known as phase cancellation. So this is where you come in. Whoa! Whoa! When we take a signal and its inverted version and then mix them together, we well get this. Uh, are you guys still there? Hello? Should we call someone? Yeah, I might say if Seb can give us a hand here. Ah, just kidding. We all good. You had us worried, guys. So as you just saw, when we try to combine a signal and its inverted version, they effectively cancel each other out, and we get nothing. It's kind of like adding negative one to one. What do you get? Zip. Zilch. A big fat zero. All right, so you get the basic gist of the attenuverter. Let's take a close up down here and maybe go through a quick patch or two. Wait, 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 hold up a second. You said we were gonna get paid for this, especially after everything you just put us through. Hey, yeah. Um, I can't find my checkbook. Look, come talk to me after the video is done and I'll see what I can do. This had better be worth it. Talk about stalling. You'll be hearing from my lawyer. Alright, let's get moving forward before those guys start a union against me. So taking a look at the quad attenuverter, it's very bare bones. We have an input, an output, and then a level control in either the positive direction or the negative direction. Then when the pot is in its middle position, the signal has no level in either direction and just sits where it is. And then we have an LED to indicate what the attenuverter is doing to the signal. This circuit is then copied four times. So we get the quad attenuverter. Well, that's all there is to it. Let's go through a quick patch or two to demonstrate how it works. So for this patch, I thought I might recreate the locked in rhythm, bass line, melody sort of thing extracted from a drum loop. 
Just so we can give a brief demonstration of how the attenuator works in both the positive and the negative direction. So if I first unmute the mixer, we can hear that we have a drum loop coming from the iPad, which is going into the bottom buffer multiple, with one copy going into the mixer so we can hear it, and then another copy coming up into the envelope extractor. Then taking a copy of the envelope extractor into the top button multiple. So we can take one copy over into the attenuverter, and then another copy directly into the individual CV of the third oscillator on the TTO. So we can hear that we're getting a little melody or bass line locked in rhythm with the drum loop. This melody is then ran through the filter and then out into the mixer so we can hear it. copy going into the attenuator is what we're putting into the mixer. So at the moment we can see that the attenuator's level is in the middle position, so it basically has no level in either direction. We can still see it flashing very slightly, but nowhere near as much as when I turn it to the right and increase its level in the positive direction. Now we can hear how the filter is being modulated in time with the rhythm of the drum loop. But now, let's turn it to the very left side and create an inversion of the extracted envelope. Now we can see that these LEDs are effectively doing the opposite from one another. And we can also hear the effect that it has on the modulation of the cutoff. Now the other idea with the attenuator is that we can also adjust its level. So if the effect of the filter is just a bit too much, we can just dial it back a little bit. Now it's a little bit more subtle. And of course it's the same in the opposite direction when we create the inversion. dial it back a little bit and it's not and it's just that little bit less crazy. And then if I adjust it to its middle position, we can hear it's basically not really doing anything at all. So the copy is being held at the input. But because there's no level in either direction, it just doesn't really affect the modulation at all. Alright, I think we get the basic gist of what's going on now. So for this basic little patch, I just wanted to prove my points about phase cancellation. So I have some music on the iPad, copyright free from Kevin McLeod of course. So we have the copy from the music coming into the buffer multiple, with one signal going directly into the mixer, and then another copy coming over into the attenuator with that also going into the mixer. Now at the moment, the signal going into the attendiverter is turned as far as it possibly can to the right. So we just have an exact copy of what's going into the multiple. But now listen what happens when I turn it to the left. And I promise I'm not making this up. Uh, 
Uh, where'd the music go? It's back again. So we can hear that when we create the inverted copy of the music, it really does cancel each other out when it combines with the positive version. I mean, it might not be too exciting to most people, but I think this is just pretty mind-blowing, really. <laughs> Alright, that's enough of that. So jumping straight into how the circuit works on the panel, let's take a look at the schematic for an attenuverter. We can see that it's a very straightforward circuit with literally just an op-amp, a handful of resistors, a potentiometer, and some jacks. I should also note a few things. First things first, credit where credit is always due. This is a circuit by Scullin Circuits. I can't remember where exactly I found it on the interwebs, but whoever you are, Mr. Skull, thank you very much. The next thing is that we have two different grounds. Our jacks are connected to the virtual ground at 6 volts, and then this potentiometer here is connected to actual ground at 0 volts. So let's imagine that we've plugged our extracted envelope signal into the input jack. The signal is fed into the op amp, which is configured with both inverting and non-inverting inputs, giving us a gain equation which is equal to V out is equal to 2 times A times the V in minus V in again, where A is equal to a number between 0 and 1, representing the position on the level control. When the level control is turned fully to the right, we can say that A is equal to 1, and that V out is equal to V in. So let's quickly plug this into the equation. If we say 2 times 1 times, and let's just say we have 7 volts on the input, 7 minus 7 equals 7. So this means that the circuit just functions as a voltage follower, as no current is flowing through either of the resistors, and it is all instead directly going through the non-inverting input and onto the output. When the level control is turned fully to the left, we can say that A is equal to zero and the non-inverting input is grounded to zero volts. So putting this into our equation, we can say that two times zero times seven minus seven just equals negative seven. So this means that all of the current flows through the negative feedback path giving us a simple inverting unity gain amplifier. Then when our level control is in the middle position, we can say that A is equal to 0.5, and the positive and negative gain cancel each other out, and V out just becomes zero. So we can say that two times 0.5 times seven minus seven is equal to nothing. So therefore, the input signal is just held there and can't make it through to the output. This circuit is incredibly simple and really offers so much flexibility with signal routing and modulation. However, due to its fairly linear response, the middle position can be very difficult to dial in. To combat this, there was a precision attenuator circuit out there which changes the response to something more non-linear. More can be found in this blog post right here which I've just been using as my information to summarise for you all. But it goes into a bit more detail about precision attendee version and the response and all that, so definitely check it out if you want to know a bit more. On the output of the attendee verter, we also have a 1K resistor, just for a little bit of current limiting. I should also point out that we have our indication LED connected to the output as well. I only just realised that I forgot to draw it in but the LED is connected to actual ground through a current limiting resistor, so there's nothing fancy going on at all. This circuit is then copied four times to make the most of the op amps inside a quad chip, so we can make four dedicated attenuator circuits onto the same module. Well, that's all there is to it. We've finally gone to the end of talking about every single module that's inside this box. I think aiming to cover all of this in 60 minutes was pretty ambitious, but hey, three hours later, we finally got there. Now you're probably thinking, but wait, Seb, there's still one more module inside the box. What about that amp in the corner? Well yeah, that's true. We still haven't talked about this module yet. And for good reason. When I moved this entire box out from the shed into my studio, I was testing that everything was still working. 
and had a signal going into the amplifier, but it was sounding all crackly and distorted, and I could faintly smell burning chip. And for those of you unlucky enough to experience the smell of a hot chip, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And I don't mean the beer bugged kind. But I quickly turned the power off and unplugged the module, and I haven't used it since. Which has been fine, because I've had to use this little preamp analog to digital converter thing for you to be able to hear everything coming from the machine properly. But to sum it up, this module is basically just an LM386 1W power amplifier circuit, which you can easily just find on Google, with a treble, middle and bass control on the input, which I have a feeling is back to front anyway, and then a volume control on the output. I also attached a dB meter circuit to the input, just so we can have some dancing lights with whatever signal is going into it. This circuit was originally a uni project for an analog electronics class that I had, so that's why we have the graphic equalizer part of it as well. I was just trying to get some bonus points basically. But I ended up turning it into a permanent circuit on some strip board and shoved the whole thing inside a Milo tin. And I'll put a photo up of it somewhere up here. But it stayed like this for ages. Busted out for only the best parties of course. But it was pretty shonky as you can imagine. Then when I started making the synth, I repurposed the circuit into a module and replaced the big speaker on the top of the Milo tin with the two sitting up here. And I've had no issues at all with this module whatsoever until I moved it into this room. So a wire could have come loose or a jack, or maybe this room's just haunted, I got no idea. But I was just thinking, maybe let's plug it back in again and put some music through it and see what happens. We could either end up with a working amp again, or we could end up with a busted chip. We'll find out. Well, first things first, we're gonna have to take this down and turn it all around again. this was. the iPad connected into a cable so we can just stick it straight into the amp. Let's first get the music going and I'll turn this back on and we'll see what happens. I'd love to be able to show just how loud this amp really can go, but it's also 11 o'clock at night, so I probably shouldn't turn it beyond that. And as you can see, we've got the little dancing display as well, which is pretty fun to watch. Well, seems to be working then. What was that? Maybe I should also give it a quick smell check, just to make sure. You never know with these things. I think it sounds pretty fine now. I'm thinking maybe that it was just a bit of a loose wire and there wasn't really enough power getting to it. Maybe I was just smelling things that were coming from my head and who knows what was going on. But the main thing is we've got an amp that works. Well that really is it. There's nothing left in this box that we haven't covered. So my plan moving forward is to start building a sequencer and the clock circuitry to drive it. When this happens I'll be able to start making melodies completely from scratch and then it'll actually pull all of these modules into one cohesive system. I am super keen to start building something again, and hopefully show off a bit more of my testing and developing stages, from breadboard to final module. I'm also back at uni in a few weeks. Final year, here we come. But when this happens, I'm gonna have like 10 minutes a week to be able to film some stuff here and there. So I apologize in advance that this slows right down for a while, but fear not. As Arnie once said, I'll be back. See you next time, everyone. All right, 
I'd better get out of here before those idiots come looking for me. Oi, we're to collect our pay. Come on, Seb, cough up. Hey, wait, he's not even here anymore. Look, 